So good morning, everyone. I think I'd like to start about now and also apologize that I have so much material to get through. Um, I usually do this kind of a thing over the course of two days, and we're going to try to jam pack it into three hours. So um, I apologize if I go a little too quickly, but I hope you get some useful things out of this. And uh, we'll go ahead and start off uh, with a your turn. So whenever you see a slide like this, I'm going to expect you to work on some sort of exercise. Uh, and I encourage you to work with your neighbor. That's why we're hoping that people sit fairly close to each other. So the first thing you can do is go to bit.ly slash use capital R 18. And that will open up the slides that I'll be working from. So I'll have some code snippets and some examples that you can sort of copy paste into your R terminal to recreate what I've done. And uh, to ensure that you have the right environment um, for executing this R code, I've also provided this RStudio Cloud instance that uh, has all the software required to run these examples. Uh, most importantly, I'm going to kind of assume that you have Plotly installed from GitHub. I'm actually planning on submitting this version uh, later today to CRAN, um, so it's a, it'll be a good way to get a sneak piece or sneak peek at a pre-release. Uh, so let's just take about maybe 30 to 60 more seconds to make sure everyone has these links. And I'm also aware that uh, we don't really have access to power plugs in this auditorium. So don't feel too bad if uh, you run out of power or if you don't have a laptop. Uh, the majority of this tutorial will just be me talking, um, which is not you know, necessarily optimal, but I'm working with three hours here, so I want to be able to cover a lot of material. But we'll have a few exercises um, that a laptop will be useful for. So a little bit about me. Uh, I graduated from Iowa State about a year and a half ago. And since then, I've been full-time freelance consulting. Um, so I do a, a variety of things as a consultant. Uh, the main piece is maintaining Plotly and doing other consulting things for Plotly. Uh, but I also you know, build uh, larger systems on top of Plotly and use other R packages to do uh, statistical um, modeling, statistical consulting, as well as R training. Um, so I've done this for a handful of different clients. And just recently, I started this intermittent appointment with the Library of Congress, which is mainly just I'm hoping it'll act sort of as a cushion for me so that I don't have to actively uh, pursue new clients or new leads. Um, but at the end of the day, really what I love to work on is tools uh, that uh, help others create interactive data visualizations and help myself create interactive data visualizations. So to motivate this work, I like to set it in the context of this data science workflow by uh, Hadley Wickham and Garrett Grolemund. Uh, so I think this is a really nice quick way of sort of succinctly describing the main pieces of a data science workflow. And if we think about how web graphics are traditionally used in this sort of workflow, uh, they're mainly just used for the communication phase or once you've actually found your interesting results, web graphics are a great platform for sharing those results with others. But web technologies are not designed for um, this iteration phase that needs to happen during the exploration and understanding phase of working with your data. And um, really, the, the useful part of interactive visualization is when we use visualization maybe to ignite a follow-up question and then the interactivity of the visualization allows us to pursue that follow-up question without you know, having to go back to your command line and precisely uh, write out what that task you want to do is. 
And people have written about the, why interactivity is useful for exploration for, for many decades. So you go all the way back to John Tukey in the 1970s, and he talks about using interactive and dynamic graphics for identifying structure in high dimensional physics data uh, to, to discover structure that their models were actually missing. And then there's a whole other class of literature that I'm sort of grouping under one bullet here, but um, lots of people talk about searching for inf information quickly without fully specified questions. So this uh, interactive graphics can help us sort of, um, you know, discover things that you might not otherwise find um, without them. And then you can also use interactive graphics to sort of uh, do better diagnostics of your statistical models and uh, lead to better understanding. So sort of my mission statement of this tutorial is, yes, interactive graphics um, or interactivity can be useful for augmenting exploration, but they're only going to be practically useful if we can iterate or create them quickly. So a lot of people have written about this first part of, you know, the theoretical part of, yes, interactivity can augment this. But, you know, I think for the majority of use cases, you know, the interactivity bit that is uh, going to be given to you is really only going to be useful if we can uh, do this very quickly. And the other side of this is once, you know, we've found our interesting results that we want to go and share with others, it's only, you know, in order to take advantage of the best parts of web graphics, we want our results to be easily distributed. And um, to really get at the best, or taking advantage of the best of both worlds here, you're going to at some point ask yourself, when is a web application actually necessary? At the very start, for you as an analyst, uh, you know, when you're just working on your machine, it might be all right to introduce a web server running R in the background, but then once you want to actually share this with the world, it's going to be a lot easier if you're using uh, client-side technologies that run in your web browser so that you don't necessarily need special software running R in the background. So the goal here should be at the end of the day, once we have the graphic that we're looking for, we want to work with client-side technologies. And even during the exploration phase, it can be good to have this goal in mind. And if you didn't already know, there's a lot of R packages that generate uh, HTML, JavaScript, CSS. So the big ones here are HTML widgets. So there's lots of R packages that build on top of HTML widgets that by default create um, web pages that will run without a web server in the background. And also HTML tools. HTML tools is a very low level R package for working with HTML that HTML widgets actually builds on. So if you create something with HTML tools, this will also be um, standalone unless you're sort of embedding HTML tools inside of something like Shiny. And the point that I sort of want to uh, hit home here is that Plotly can actually do quite a lot in a standalone page. So we should sort of dis uh, explore what is possible there before we actually move to, say, embedding Plotly within Shiny. And there's sort of three main categories in terms of how you can add, like, non-default reactivity to your Plotly graphs that will work in a uh, client-side fashion. And most of our time is going to be spent on this first part here. I've spent a lot of time working on this framework uh, that some people call graphical database queries. Um, so this has existed in other interactive graphics software in the past. Um, and if you're familiar with the Plotly for our book, I have a link to this chapter here that I call Linking Views Without Shiny, which gives you some more detail about this framework. 
So hopefully everyone in here knows that with the R package Plotly, you can make ggplot2 graphics interactive via this ggplotly function here. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a ggplot2 object, and in this case, I'm visualizing this TX housing data set. And in this TX housing data set, uh, each row corresponds to um, a measurement made on the monthly level for different Texas cities. And uh, it has various measurements like median. So here I'm taking the date variable, mapping that to X, median to Y, and grouping by city so that I make sure I have one line per city. So by giving this to ggplotly, I get a couple things for free. I can hover over stuff in the graphic, and then I can see specifically what value is going, is being mapped to that specific graphical mark. And then you can also zoom in and zoom out on this graphic. Um, but I also want to, there was a couple people in the survey that I sent out, they asked, how do I customize the tooltip that appears by default? If you're using ggplotly, one thing you can do is you can take advantage of this text aesthetic here. This isn't officially a part of ggplot2, but it's something that ggplotly will pick up on and automatically include in the tooltip. And if you notice in this other one here where I didn't use the text aesthetic, uh, by default, ggplotly will put all of the aesthetic mappings in the tooltip. It's basically going to show you all the stuff up here that I've specified. But you can use this tooltip argument to essentially say, just show this collection of aesthetics um, that I've provided. So by uh, supplying a custom string to the text aesthetic, and then saying tooltip equal to text, that's a way of completely controlling what actually appears in the text for a tooltip. Um, so this is very much like a workaround for ggplotly, uh, but there's ways to do this with the non-ggplot2 approach that we'll cover uh, very briefly. Uh, but my, the main point here that I want to make is it's very easy, both with ggplotly and plotly, uh, to uh, make it easy to interactively highlight elements in a graph. And you can specify, um, you know, essentially how you want to make this query or this highlight via this highlighting key function here. So you give that the data, you were essentially adding some semantics to the data and saying, if I click or highlight uh, something in this graph, I want to highlight all of the rows that correspond to the specific city that I've selected. So now if I click on a line, it will highlight uh, the specific city that I've clicked on. So I could go through and see that there's actually some interesting missing values for different cities. But really this example is just designed to sh show you how to use this highlight key function. So same, really it's the same visualization code as before. We're just supplying uh, different data that has the additional semantics meaning uh, that tells Plotly if I highlight anything, select all of the rows in the data that correspond to the value of city that I've selected. And then this highlight function is a way of specifying different types of interactions that trigger a highlight or to bring up, say, a dropdown with all of the possible selections that I can make so that I can indirectly, say, search for a specific city which um, for cases like this where it's very hard to maybe identify something that I'm already interested in via the graphic, I can just search for it by name this way. And then also this dynamic equal to true part here makes it so that uh, this little color widget shows up here so that I can interactively control the color of the highlighting. So I could change this to blue. 
And then if you hold the shift key, uh, it will actually enable persistent selection, meaning that when I make a new selection, it will remember the previous selection or the previous highlight and bring in the new highlight. And when you've changed colors in this way, that's a great way of making comparisons between um, different units of interest. And this is fairly general in the sense that we can use this same system to link multiple views and link different views that uh, maybe have, maybe uh, one view shows the raw data here on the right hand side and link that to an aggregation. And in this case, I'm looking at the number of months that are missing for each city so that if I click on a line here, I can see, well, South Padre Island has the most number of, or has the highest number of missing values. But then I can flip through and see all the different cities with a high number of missingness and discover that there is actually some different types of miss missingness here. Um, so San Marcos, it looks like there was data that was recorded initially, but then data went missing at some point. And again, I can use the dynamic widget and hold the shift key to make comparisons. Oops. Like so. So here's a little diagram of how we can think about what's happening here um, to give us some intuition of how to um, create some of our own visualizations. You can think of this as, um, if you just think about the data set that was used to create each one of these views. And um, in this case, when I click a point, since I've used this highlight key function to say, when I click on a point, select the city, essentially, it will go back to the aggregated data that I've provided to the visualization, filter down to this specific row, but then it's also attached to the raw data so that when I select just this one row in the aggregated data, I'll then filter the raw data down to multiple rows since these are linked according to the city column. And then the time series will just know how to update from that definition. So you can think of this essentially like an SQL query where you're selecting all the rows from some table, uh, actually both tables in this case, where city is equal to the thing that I've, the value that I've um, interactively selected. And the same framework, the same system, uh, works pretty generally across all plotly trace types. So you could link, say, a 2D view to a 3D view. In this case, I'm looking at tropical storms. And I found a storm that uh, wavered at a very high altitude pretty uh, long into its path. And then I can zoom in on the 3D globe and see that this storm actually circled around some island in the Caribbean. Uh, it works with aggregates as well, so you can click and drag and say brush multiple bars in a histogram and tie that back to an interactive map. And we, we have uh, support with Mapbox. And uh, actually in the dev version, you can give this plot underscore Mapbox function an SF object if you know what SF is, and it will create a Mapbox visualization from that SF object. So this example is actually using some of that functionality to link a uh, histogram with um, the various counties from North Carolina. And this also works with list columns. So you could think about, if you've ever heard of a list column, it's a way of having essentially multiple values in a particular row um, so here, we can leverage the list column 
uh, for, say, a, a dendrogram where you would want, say, a particular node or a particular branch to represent multiple values. So here I'm clicking on, a, on these different nodes to uh, highlight uh, multiple states, which is linked to multiple views, and it also works in conjunction with animation. And we'll get, uh, we'll actually do an example like this, where this is using the plot map box again with SF objects to link uh, map box to the DT package, uh, which has some support for the same framework that's in Plotly. So that's, I've just kind of thrown a lot at you. I just wanted to get sort of your mind going with what is possible with Plotly. And uh, I would encourage you to do this part A, which is why we handed out the notebooks to everyone, where I want this to be fairly conceptual with no code. I just want you to think of a question uh, that maybe you're working on already, or think of a data set that you're familiar working with, and uh, see if you can't answer, or think of a graphic that you could use to answer that question from your data. And as a bonus, let's try to draw it on that notepad. But if you don't have anything in mind, go ahead and do part B. All right, so time's up. We'll uh, hopefully have time to come back to this one. I'll give you some time to actually maybe work on an implementation of what you've done. And hopefully, I give you a framework uh, for figuring out how to do this with Plotly or at least get somewhere with it. Um, but again, I, I kind of want to walk through another example showing how this framework can be used in another way. So we've seen how to use the highlight key function as well as the highlight function to essentially tell Plotly that when I do a specific interaction, I want to query rows of my data according to some column that's in the data. Um, so I'm going to take the same TX housing data and just focus on these four variables of interest and filter down to just four rows for sake of demonstration, or sorry, four cities for sake of demonstration. And I just want to ask this pretty vague question of how does price differ, differ across cities? So one way I could look at this data to sort of get at that answer is to come up with a small multiples display where I have one panel per city. And then I'm also wrapping lines um, by year and putting month on the x-axis. So now I have multiple lines. With, within a given city, I have multiple lines, one, one line corresponding to a different year. And then essentially looking at like a monthly seasonal pattern, um, but it doesn't really look like there's much month, monthly seasonality here. So uh, I could basically go back to the data, and maybe I'm interested in querying or looking at a specific year. So I could say highlight key TX uh, housing data, and uh, let's query the year so that now in this graphic, if I click on a particular line, this is just a screen screenshot that links to the interactive. Um, but if I see something interesting, like say, uh, well, this looked like a really bad year for Odessa, by hovering, I can see this is 2006. But then by clicking, I can see if that was a bad year for the other cities as well so that I can compare both within city, like how um, this year basically ranks to other years, um, but then also see how that year compares across cities. And then we sort of saw this, but uh, with this highlight function, um, I don't know if you've ever used this dot last dot value in R, but I find it pretty useful. It's a way of accessing the last thing that you printed to your R console. Um, so if I had printed 
this ggplotly object, I could get back that ggplotly object by saying last, last value, put that into the highlight function, uh, change the mode of interaction from a click to a hover, and then also use this default values argument, which is a way of, um, you know, this is sort of useful for you as the analyst once you've done some exploring but want to share this with someone else and want to show them essentially a highlights um, by default. Now when I open up this graphic, 2006 is going to be highlighted by default. So the user doesn't have to do anything when they open it up that year is selected, but they can still go in and hover and change the highlight if they want to. Um, and we already saw these uh, select ties and dynamic arguments. Um, and I was using the shift key before to enable persistent selection. But you can also set this at the command line to say always use persistent selection. So now I can click, change the brush color. And now I no longer have to hold the shift key. I'll, I can just click on different things. And um, when I make a new selection, Plotly won't uh, forget about that previous selection that I made. It will just bring in the new one. Um, oh, good question. Uh, th so the question was, how do you essentially clear uh, those selections? There is an argument in highlights called off. And let me just show you quickly the help page. So this highlight page is kind of where I've documented a lot of things in terms of controlling the mode of interaction. And you'll notice uh, by default the on argument, this is the event that will trigger um, the highlights. By default that will be a click. And then there's this off argument, and the default for that is actually inferred if, if you've specified a different on event, then I'll figure out a smart off event to like clear the selection. Um, but es essentially, the long story short is, in a lot of cases, it will be this plotly double click event, so that um, most of the time, when you go in, you can clear this by doing a double click on um, the relevant graph. So again, if I click a line, here's the highlights. But then if I double click on the plot background, then the highlighting is cleared. Yeah, so the question was, is it possible to generate a legend when you do the highlighting? That is actually related to my next slide here. Um, it's, it's just really a different example of using this same argument. So there's this selected argument here, which allows you to control uh, attributes of the new highlight that is being introduced into um, your graphic. So if, if you're familiar with Plotly language at all, this actually adds a new trace to your graphic, and you can control completely the attributes of that trace. Um, so there's a specific attribute called show legend, and um, that's a way of controlling whether a trace shows up in the legend entries or not. So I think if you would just change this, you, you might have to do one other thing. But essentially, uh, for most graphics, if you use this um, attribute selected and then say show legend equal to true, then a legend should pop up. And if you want to guide your users um, with an example like this, rather than having them 
uh, click or hover through all of the different years. You could almost like automate these queries for them by flipping through the years via an animation. So if you're familiar at all with GG Animate, I know that the keynote is going to be all about how they've changed the API for this. Um, but it used to be with GG Animate, uh, you could provide this frame aesthetic, and GG Plotly works in this same exact way, where you can provide a frame aesthetic, which essentially um, works a lot like a group aesthetic. But in, instead of ensuring there's one visual object per group, it will ensure there's one animation frame per group. So how this works is, you know, this was essentially the graphic that we were working with before. I've added some alpha blending, so that's why the black lines are a bit transparent here. And then I add another layer where the frame is now mapped to year instead of group. And then by default, it will just show me the first frame. So that's why I just have one red line here. In 2000, um, actually, three of these cities didn't even have data. It was just Galveston. So now, if I click play, this will animate through the different years in the data. And one of the reasons why I wanted to show this example where we're linking multiple panels via like a facet wrap or a facet grid in ggplot2 is I think this can be a really powerful technique when you have like multiple factors and you want to look at sort of the interaction between those factors. Um, so this can be very useful for comparing both like within a panel and across panels. So here. Let me get out the interactive for this. Oops. So here's some different data on uh, English Premier uh, English Premier League soccer teams, and on the y-axis here, I'm keeping track of the number of points a particular team has accumulated throughout the season. So that's the x-axis, is the um, game in the season. That's why everybody sort of starts around zero, is because this is going to be the cumulative points relative to the average number of points. And then uh, why th that metric is sort of useful for visualization in this case because then we get these lines sort of going above zero or below zero. Above zero meaning uh, this team has done really well throughout the season. Below zero meaning this team has not done so well. So I can identify right away. Uh, let me change the color here. I can identify right away uh, Man U because they did really well in 2007. And then by clicking on this line, I can see how they did throughout these years as well. So I can see that uh, 2008, 2010, these were really good years. 2011, 2013, not so much. And then again, I can go in and say change the color, search for, say, arrival of this team. And I forgot to hold the shift key. and uh, basically highlight a different team, a different color, and then I can have this nice comparison both within years and across years. So let's take a few minutes and uh, you can regenerate this uh, graphic that I was just showing you by using this R code here. It's, it's shipped as a demo to the Plotly package. So, uh, this is going to work best if you're using our studio. Um, you could use this our studio cloud instance I've provided. You could. Uh, what I would recommend is basically make sure the viewer is fairly big when you run this. Let 
did that run? Oh, I need to authenticate that again, but just make sure your viewer is fairly tall or else it's, the sizing isn't going to work so great. Um, but if you run that demo, you should get something like this. And then go ahead and do these two parts below. I believe this demo is going to require the GitHub version of Plotly. Um, but if you have any trouble running this or anything else, please raise your hand and I'll come and help. Or our helpers can help as well. Okay, it seems like for some reason, um, some people who are accessing the cloud instance, there isn't like the right version of Plotly installed. Um, so if that's the case, and you still want to use the cloud instance, um, just make sure you uh, either use DevTools or this remotes package. It has this install GitHub function. So if you install, um, also the, the email that I sent the attendees, I, I got a list of email attendees that were hoping to attend the workshop. If you have that email, I have a note about this. Um, basically, I, I provide the code for installing from GitHub. And you'll need that GitHub version to run this demo. So if you're having problems with that, that's how you can solve it. Uh, how many people were actually able to run it and run this Plotly JSON function? Okay, a good number. Um, how many people had problems actually doing number one? A handful. Yeah, so it's not super straightforward how to do the persistent selection. You have to be fairly careful about when and how long you're holding the shift key, especially when you're using this dropdown. So I can change the brush color to change the highlighting color. Uh, but then, like, as soon as you go to this drop-down, I would suggest holding the shift key even before you start searching for something and hold it, hold it, hold it until you uh, select a team and then you can release. Um, so there's probably some improvements I could make there to make it easier um, so that you don't have to keep holding the shift key that entire time. Uh, so, does anyone want to take a stab at what this Plotly JSON is doing? Yeah, so JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It's the data structure that JavaScript uses. Um, so, when you create a Plotly graphic, I'll have a diagram about this, but Plotly will create uh, both an R list, which is then converted to a JSON object, and that is used to render your graphic. So with the Plotly JSON, you can get a very low-level description of what uh, is actually going in to Plotly.js, the functionality that enables all of this. So if you just run Plotly JSON and don't even give it an object, it will take the last Plotly graph that you've created. So if you're able to run the demo, you should be able to just type Plotly underscore JSON, and that should produce a widget like this. And this is using the list viewer package, actually, to have a nice interactive um, widget to um, navigate through the JSON that you're providing to Plotly.js. So this um, English Premier League visualization actually has nine different layers of data. And in Plotly.js language, we think of each layer of data that's provided to a figure as a different trace. So this is uh, terminology specific to Plotly, where we, keep, we call each one of these things a trace. So this first trace here 
I have a X and a Y attribute. These are basically defining the X and Y locations for the lines. And it, it turns out if you study this enough, um, these nine different traces are data for the nine different panels that are in the visualization. So this first trace here is going on the X and Y axis, basically the first panel. But then if you look at the second one here, this is going on a different X axis. And there's a couple, there's really one main part of the trace that you want to be aware of, and that's the trace type. We have uh, over 30 different trace types in Plotly. Um, doing anything from like scatter is really the lowest level type of trace type where this is um, really just working with vector type uh, graphical objects like points, lines, and uh, text data. And if you use this uh, trace type in a smart way, you can use it to create polygons and that sort of thing. Um, but then we also have trace types that are more specific, like um, histograms, where we'll actually do the binning for you, or create box plots for you, where you just supply the raw data, and Plotly.js will do the aggregations for you. Um, but yeah, so here with this trace, or uh, scatter trace type here, um, this, the mode attribute is what determines if I'm just drawing points or actually connecting these points with lines. You can do both markers and lines with a scatter trace type as well. Um, so if, if you don't know any Plotly.js, but you know some ggplot2, this is a pretty neat way to start learning some Plotly.js, where you can give your ggplot2 object to ggplotly, run Plotly.json on that, and then you can see how we're sort of mapping ggplot2 to Plotly.js. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in here that you could walk through. Um, here is basically all the information for drawing the lines. But then the layout has all sorts of stuff of like defining uh, what's going into the x-axis objects, um, the y-axis objects, also things like the annotations. So if, if you've ever had troubles with um, like legend titles, which is like, you know, one of the most major things that should probably be fixed in ggplotly. If, if you're struggling with like the position or like what's actually going into a legend title, you could actually reach down to this level and say, uh, take this um, annotation that's um, maybe not positioned quite how I want it and change the position that way. Um, so these are all, most of these are annotations that show up in the facet strips in that visualization. So these are, um, this is sort of like the on graph text, uh, the annotations piece here. And then there's also a, where'd you go? Shapes attribute here. And um, I leverage this in ggplotly to like draw the, dark gray facet strips in ggplot that you see. Um, so these would be rectangles, but you can use the shapes API to do like circles or rectangles or lines as well. But yeah, this is a pretty low, low level way of working with Plotly.js that you probably, um, you know, in most cases, you want to leverage a higher level tool like ggplotly. So as I mentioned, when you uh, print a ggplotly or a plotly object, sort of two main things happen uh, before things are sent to your web browser. Underneath the hood, I call this plotly build function that you can access directly to get the full R list that uh, maps to the JSON that I was just showing you. 
So if you'd like to um, actually work at that level and work with an R list, you can use the Plotly build function to essentially uh, like map the ggplot object to Plotly.js and then work at that lower level um, with Plotly.js. And if, if you find yourself starting to need to work at this level more and more, there's also this schema function that you should be aware of that uh, this is the, you might be familiar with uh, this link here. I reference it in the documentation quite a bit. Um, but this figure reference is actually generated from this data structure that I send with the R package. So this reference is a way of, say, if you wanted to add a title to your plot, you could search for title. And then these are all the different attributes in Plotly.js that are relevant for a title. So you could click on this here. And um, this is the attribute that would set the um, title of the plot. But I find this widget also pretty useful for, um, I guess, searching for things. Because um, in addition to like a search box like we had on this website, if you don't have a great internet connection, which I'm finding out more and more in Australia is something you can't really assume, uh, this, this website can be pretty clunky. Uh, it's pretty heavy. There's a lot of stuff that your browser has to load. Um, sometimes it could be better to work from this schema because it's lighter weight and you can be guaranteed that this is the actual version of Plotly.js that the R package is using. Uh, usually this uh, reference website is updated every so often, so sometimes it's showing you a out-of-date version of Plotly.js. Um, but if you use a schema function, you can be sure that, okay, this is the actual uh, Plotly.js specification that I need to work with with the R package. So as I mentioned, we have over 30 different trace types, and you can see the names for those different trace types here under this traces component or attribute. So if we went into scatter, uh, all of these will have sort of two pieces here. The meta isn't so as, as important as the attributes part. This is all of the attributes that scatter trace types will understand. So it will understand, obviously, an X value and a Y value. Um, but then it also has things like another important piece of the scatter trace type is the mode. So this will, um, you could use this to draw both markers and lines, or just lines, or just markers, um, or text as well. And then you can also specify, like, you know, the interactive properties of this um, trace type. So you could control, um, if you're drawing polygons, this can be a useful attribute, whether you're hovering over each point along the polygon or if you're just hovering over the fill of the polygon. Or um, how you actually want to, uh, well, I won't get, this one's kind of complicated, but say if you did have a polygon-like graphical object, you could specify the fill color this way. Uh, I won't get into all of this stuff, but just know that there's a lot of um, options there available to you. And uh, in addition to providing a description, which is something that you, you can get from this reference page, another thing this schema widget is useful for is showing you like a value type, like whether this should be a true or a false value, or whether this should be a numeric value, or um, if there's a default value provided, that sort of thing. 
Um, so you can work with Plotly.js with more than just ggplotly. There are currently about, uh, including ggplotly, four different ways to initialize a Plotly object. So plot underscore Lee is going to be the most flexible approach where you can work directly with Plotly.js and uh, not work with ggplot2 if you don't prefer to work with the ggplot2 approach. Um, and actually, uh, to give you a little bit of idea of how my workflow works, um, I still very much, like, I learned R via ggplot2, and I still very much, like, think in that way. So a lot of the times I'll be working with ggplot2 and then use ggplotly just to get a quick interactive version. And that, I feel, is useful for your own exploration, your own iteration, because it's very quick and easy. But then as soon as you need to like start polishing things, it can be useful to learn about this plot underscore Lee function, because um, in a lot of cases, it's not too hard to translate ggplot2 to uh, plot underscore Lee. And that will be a little bit um, better for you to control in terms of you can control exactly like what's going in, into your figure. Um, and then there's um, sort of like geom line or geom points in ggplot2. There are these add underscore markers, add underscore lines, add, add underscore bars that kind of work like the geom equivalent in ggplot2, which this is a way of sort of like adding a layer or adding traces to your graph. And then there's also functions for modifying your graph. You can use a style function, which can be, it's more useful for like ggplotly, where um, say ggplotly creates a visual where you don't quite like say the coloring of the tooltip or something like that where ggplotly obviously doesn't have an API for changing the color of a tooltip, but you could use the style function to change specific attributes of the underlying data structure so that it looks um, the way you want it to. And then the layout will actually, you know, it can modify the layout component of the graph. And then uh, if you have a Plotly account, which is free to use by default, we give you, we sort of cap you in terms of what you're able to do on the Plotly cloud. But you can send uh, your data or your graphs to Plotly um, cloud. And then you can also retrieve public graphs off of Plotly cloud as well. And also work directly with um, Plotly's API, so you could do, use this to like search public feeds, search like all the graphs that have been um, uploaded to Plotly. But I don't want to spend much time on that. Um, but just to give you sort of a very quick look at how Plot underscore Lee works, uh, here would be an example where I just basically give plot underscore Lee two, two different variables in this case. Um, mapping cut, a discrete factor, to the x-axis, and clarity, another discrete factor, to the y-axis. And Plotly will do something sensible for you without even specifying what trace type you want it to create. Um, so if you actually were to run code like this, just for this first plot, you get a little message here, and it's telling me, Plotly is telling me, I haven't specified the trace type, so I'm going to do something sensible for you. And based on the information that you provided, essentially discrete on X, discrete on Y, it would be sensible to use the histogram 2D. We also have a, a heat map trace type, which will essentially do, uh, create a similar visual here. But with a heat map, you would have to specify the counts of the cells. Here with a histogram 2D, I'm, uh, Plotly.js is doing all the binning for me and creating, uh, counting the number of occurrences in each cat combination of categories. 
Similarly here, if I change the Y to color, say, uh, then it will create um, essentially like a dodged bar chart. So this is kind of like opinionated, but just know that um, you can give plot underscore Lee some data without even specifying a trace type, and it'll do something for you, which then, you know, if, if you really like this, but you wanted to change something specific about it, one of the things you could do is first go to Plotly JSON, look and study like how this was actually, like what this actually maps to, and then use schema to maybe change other attributes about this visual. Uh, so let's go ahead and create that subplot object on the last slide and plotly JSON to study how it maps to JSON. And I'm not going to really spend a whole lot of time on how to use plot underscore Lee, but do know that there's a Plotly cookbook chapter in the Plotly for our book that covers a lot of those details of how, how this works. And again, if you're having trouble setting up your environment, um, I'm happy to help you get set up. Yeah, so this, there's a link here to a chapter in the Plotly for our book that you can access at plotly-book.cpsievert.me. And that's just linking to the second, the second section here. So I had a couple good questions. Um, one of them being, you know, when you use this Plotly JSON function to look at a Plotly visual, you can actually go in here and in some cases, like, change the values of stuff. Um, but this will not actually go back to the object that you fed into Plotly JSON. Um, I should probably figure a way to lock this down and make it so that you're not confused by like changing these values that will come back to the object that you provided into it. Um, and also, I didn't really provide an example of, I just kind of m mentioned this in passing, but you know, if you create a ggplotly object and the interactivity or there's something about the visual that uh, you don't quite like, you can uh, modify that object after you've converted it to Plotly. So here I'm converting to Plotly and then using the style function to work with the uh, Plotly.js attributes that you can get the definition for via that schema. So if I study that schema a bit, and if I look at the JSON for this underlying object, I'd find that this is actually a scatter trace type. And so I could find some relevant attributes via the schema, and then go in and change the defaults that um, ggplotly has provided by default. So here, I'm changing the hover level, the color of the background of that hover label, and um, also providing some extra information in the hover info. This hover info uh, is a way of letting Plotly.js automatically pick up on like the X and Y or Z or text attributes that you've provided. So instead of just showing the text, which, which is the default by ggplotly, um, I'm also adding the X and Y information here, this way. And instead of hovering on the fill, like if you look up here, I'm hovering on the fill. 
if I change that to points, then I, it will pick up on every data point that's supplied. So I wanted that to basically be like a very quick introduction to how plot, plot underscore Lee works. And now I want to bring this back to the linked views uh, infrastructure that I mentioned at the very get-go. And I also want to mention that when you use this linking with uh, certain plotly trace types that compute aggregations for you, you can make it so that, uh, say, you brush and drag and click, or brush and drag to select a group of cars. Um, I've basically, by uh, clicking and dragging this, uh, all these cars that have four cylinders, then Plotly.js will, uh, on the fly, compute new aggregates for like box plots or bar charts. Um, we have different types of like histogram densities for both 1D and 2D. Uh, so that I can sort of interactively like condition on um, four cylinders and then see if that makes a difference on say the miles per gallon city. Uh, so instead of like doing a one-way ANOVA, I can interactively do some sort of like two-way ANOVA. And then I can see, well, you know, by having a small number of cylinders, that's going to have a pretty significant impact on the miles per gallon for both SUV and the pickups. But for these smaller cars, the number of cylinders, uh, having a small number of cylinders isn't really going to get you much in terms of miles per gallon. Uh, but, you know, I should be sort of careful to make this sort of inference because here, that box plot is actually being computed from three, um, three data points. And the SUVs, it's being computed from eight data points. Um, so here is the actual R code or the implementation behind that. Uh, for the scatter plot, I'm leveraging Plotly's ability to um, you know, by default, if I give it a numeric X and Y, it will create a scatter plot for me. So that's the dots object here. It's just a mapping of engine displacement to X, number of cylinders to Y, and coloring by the class. And then doing similar types of things to, uh, similar mappings to create the box plots and the bar charts. And then feeding that into the subplot function. And with the subplot function, this actually works recursively. So you could feed a subplot into a subplot. And that's how I get this sort of arrangement here where I have uh, this first row, I have two columns sharing you know, equidistance here. But then on the bottom row, I get at the full width of both of these columns by essentially creating this subplot first, but then feeding that subplot into another subplot so that I, um, so that the bottom row will span the full width. So by default, uh, this part here will, you know, if, I'll just show you. If I were just to run this first subplot, I'd get the thing with the two columns. But then if I feed that into another subplot and specify I want two rows, then it will take those first two columns, put it the first, um, the full width, and then the, the bar chart will then span the bottom full width as well. And just to show you some more trace types here, um, we also have a violin chart, which is kind of like the box plot, but it's really a uh, histogram that's mirrored on its baseline. So I could link this to a scatter plot so that when I brush and drag a certain region or a certain collection of points, then 
uh, these aggregates will be updated. And let's skip over that implementation. Um, but let's bring it back again to the TX housing data. I could create the raw time series. This is created via ggplot2. Um, but I could make it so that, again, I'm using the, like, the highlight key function to say, when I click on something, highlight all of the rows that correspond to this city. But then I could link that to an aggregated trace type so that when I make the new selection, uh, I will come back to this example because we are supposed to be on break. Sorry. Uh, let's come back at a little after 11. <laughs>